From the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and Sirius XM, this is the Work and Life podcast, which explores how to create harmony among the different parts of life, work, home, community, and the private self, your mind, body, and spirit. The conversation you're about to hear was originally recorded on the Work and Life radio show on Sirius XM 111, business radio powered by Wharton. Here is your host, founding director of Wharton's Work-Life Integration Project and author of the bestseller, Total Leadership, Professor Stu Friedman. My guest for this episode is Tom Tierney, who is the chairman and co-founder of The Bridge Span Group, which is an independent nonprofit organization that's designed to provide professional services to social sector leaders to help scale impact, build leadership, and advance philanthropic effectiveness. Prior to Bridgespan, Tom was the CEO of Bain and Company uh, for eight years, during which time the company's revenues grew sixfold. He is uh, chairman at eBay and he lectures at Harvard Business School, at Wharton, Stanford Business School, and is the leadership chair at West Point Academy. Tom was featured in my own 2014 book, Leading the Life You Want, and my conversation with him took place the day it was released, but this episode is more relevant now than ever. We talk about mortality and confronting life's important questions, hitting the pause button as he does with daily reflection, Tom's lessons learned from his lecturing at West Point, what it means to build a life and not a resume. And he offers some specific steps that that you can take to make smarter choices about engaging your loved ones in a meaningful way throughout your life and shaping the life you want towards achieving the things that matter most. I hope you enjoy these inspiring words from a true teacher and role model of leadership from the point of view of the whole person. Now, here is my conversation with Tom Tierney. Tom, welcome to Work and Life. Well, Stu, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I still feel embarrassed uh, in I many know. ways because all of us are a work in process. I don't think of myself as remarkable. I think of myself as, uh, as a regular person who's just trying to do the best with whatever little gifts he has. Can you tell us, um, I, I know listeners have a, probably a lot of things that they want to learn from you, but let me, let me start out by asking you about one thing that you often have said in my classes, and you have spoken in my classes so eloquently. You are by far the highest rated guest uh, executive that I've ever had in my classes here in teaching for 30 years. No, no joke. Um, you're, you're spellbinding for students because you've got a real story to tell, and it's about building a life, not a resume. What is, what is it that you mean by that? Well, uh, I heard an interesting phrase the other day uh, that said, you know, days are long, but life is short. <laughs> and it is painfully short. Uh, and uh, acknowledging that allows one to step back and ask, what matters? Uh, you know, what matters in my unique life? No one mm -hmm. has ever been born and has ever lived like anyone, uh, equivalent to anyone who's listening to this or ever will listen to this. In other words, we're all very different. And so when I talk about building a life, not a resume, implicit in that is that we have an opportunity to take advantage of our unique circumstances, our unique gifts, and applying those in a way that achieves whatever quote-unquote success we want to achieve with our life. Mm -hmm. And when what matters at the end of the day is the extent to which we have achieved those things in life that matter to us most, not what is on a piece of paper, not what is in your bank account, but actually what you have done with your gifts in the context of your life. And one of the skills that I think you have exemplified so well in your life and career is the capacity to uh, envision your legacy. Uh, tell us, uh, what is it that you've done to be able to keep the big picture in mind throughout your life and career? Well, I guess some people would say I'm a little bit obsessive about this. If you focus in on, you know, what is success in life for me and mm -hmm. confront that question, you begin to ask yourself that question 
in, at, at various times. And I ask myself that question on airplanes, and I'll drop, uh, drop some notes on that. But, but one thing I've done consistently for now many decades is at the end of the year, I'll take two or three days and, and do a mini retreat uh, with myself and my notebooks and ask, okay, how did I do this year? in the context of my aspirations for my life on all dimensions with my wife, with my sons, with my community, with my spiritual life, Mm -hmm. with my professional life, with my volunteer life, all those various dimensions that you talk about. How am I doing? What's working? What isn't working? No kidding. And then how am I thinking about where this is all taking me in a year or three years or ten years? And asking those questions and writing down notes and in my case, I keep a journal, and I've got dozens of volumes now, mm-hmm. probably a couple dozen, that capture some of these ideas. And for me, the, the act of writing it down helps me think about it. So in terms of building a life, I confront the questions. I don't let myself dodge these questions. Mm-hmm. You know, I overcome uh, th- that force of inertia and complacency, which is so easy. And you wake up and say, gosh, it's been three years since I've done that, or I haven't exercised in six weeks, and oh my gosh, well, time just marches on, and we have to get out ahead of time. So I confront the questions, I keep notes, I ask myself, how am I doing? I get feedback from others. My wife, Karen, is my uh, is my best coach, my best friend, and she's always asking me, you know, are you sure you're living up to what you want to mm. achieve mm. with your life? So that amount of, of inquiry and self-awareness is what ultimately, at least in my case, helps me make the most of whatever little gifts I've got. That time, though, that you invest, I mean, that's pretty significant to just take a, a couple few days every year to just check out and reflect. It seems like such a great idea I'm sure you face a lot of pressure, though, to get on with other things at that time. How do you, you know, how do you face that pressure and, and you know, keep that commitment? Well, um, discipline is a really important attribute. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, would you rather have someone who's 20% smarter or 20% more disciplined? All else equal, I'll take the person who's 20% more disciplined because that person is able to make the tough trade-offs at the margin. And, you know, building a life, uh, leading the life you want in in an integrated way is all about making these these mostly tiny Mm trade-offs that over time move you in the direction you want to go in. Mm -hmm. Here's a little one. I walk to work. I live in Boston. I walk to work. And in the building I work in, there's an escalator. Next to the escalator are 45 steps. Okay. And I take the 45 steps. That's not because I'm special. That's because I'm saying, hey, listen, this is a chance for me to get a tiny bit of exercise going up those steps. Right. So it's just being smart about your choices. I could ride that escalator Mm -hmm. and... You know, it'd be a little easier. Now you're making me you feel guilty for riding the, the uh, elevator in the, in the parking garage today, but keep, but keep going. So, so the point is, discipline manifests itself in, in, in little ways. Mm. It's the discipline to exercise. It's the discipline to say no to certain things. It's the discipline to say, you know, today I'm working at home. That's how it's going to be. Uh, it's the discipline not to go in to the office on the weekend. It's a discipline not to check email. Uh, after a certain time at night, you name it. So, but so when you've got pressure, day, I'm sorry. Uh, when you've got, let me just jump in here and ask if you've got pressure from, say, colleagues uh, who have a you know a urgent matter to deal with, and you know you're shut away to you know, in in dealing with some other aspect of your life that's important to you. How do you uh, what what tips do you have about how you've discovered uh, to to you know keep those boundaries when you need to? It's a, it's a great question, Stu, and. At least for me, most of the challenge is in my own head. It's thinking that somehow I'm indispensable or that plus or minus a day really matters. And, you know, it's interesting because I've experimented with this, and a couple of times I've gone away and been off the grid for a week, really off the grid. And surprisingly enough, the world has not stopped. (laughs) 
And not only it that, does surprise you, though, right? You get back and like, yeah. hey, didn't everything stop? What happened here? Well, not only does the world not stop, mm-hmm. of the hundreds of emails that you've received during that time, the vast majority are obsolete by the time you get back. <laughs> Somebody else has handled it. Somebody else has handled it. It wasn't as urgent mm-hmm. after all. You know, an awful lot of what we get confused on mm-hmm. is trying to parse out what is urgent versus what is important. And what's your method for doing that? I ask the questions. I say, you know, how, no kidding, how important really is that? How important is it today? How important is it for two years from now? Because we get wrapped up in to-do lists, Mm -hmm. and we get wrapped up in being reactive to the environment. And all of a sudden, we're just, we're on defense the entire time. It's like we're backpedaling, as opposed to saying, no, wait a second. Here are my priorities for the year in various aspects of my life. Here are the things that really matter that I have to invest in. And those take precedence over everything else. So you keep that in mind to integrate the different parts of your life for mutual gain. So it's asking the question, and you've been at that now for 40 years, right? Just continually making time to to learn from your experience, looking back, looking forward. Right. It, asking questions, creating feedback loops so you're self-aware as to how you're doing and what you're doing well, having the discipline to make the trade-offs so that you don't get caught up in inertia or trapped by what other people want. You are motivated and moving in the direction that you want. This is Stu Friedman. You're listening to Work and Life. I'm speaking with Tom Tierney. And in the first part of our conversation, we talked about confronting mortality, creating our legacy, building a life and not a resume, and asking the right questions through constant reflection and relentless prioritization, the power of discipline that his uh, practice represents. In the second part of the conversation, we're going to talk about Tom's experiences leading workshops at West Point, his greatest flaw and how he compensates for it how he's built systems of feedback into his life, and some big ideas that are advice uh, that all of us can use having to do with humility and courage. Now back to my conversation with the amazing Tom Tierney. Now, you have been uh, an educator for uh, much of your adult life, too, and I've seen you in action in my classroom, and I also know that you're now uh, doing work with West Point. That's right. Uh, what, a, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a leadership professor there, uh, what is it that you focus on in your, in your teaching at West Point? What, what's your main objective there? Um, my primary objective is to help the cadets and the junior faculty confront questions that they would not otherwise confront with their peers in a way that's useful. So what does that mean? Um, I've led multiple seminars, for example, on how to succeed at life. And some people said, you know, gosh, you're talking to uh, college seniors. These are firsties, they're called. They're headed out mm-hmm. uh, to serve uh, at least five years. They owe the government five years of active duty. And, you know, they're not thinking about how to succeed at life. They've got commitments, and their path is pretty well specified for five full years. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? That's wrong. This question about success in life is as relevant when you're you know, 20 is when you're 35, if you're a faculty member at West Point, a junior faculty member, Mm -hmm. or if you're 60, because all of us are confronted with these trade-offs. All of us are interested in and concerned about how we are going to integrate our, you know, our work with our home and family life, with our personal life and self-development, with community. Those issues are so fundamental. And so what I do at West Point, and I'm doing the best I can, I think I'm adding little value, is lead seminars from two to three hours where a cross-section of cadets and and sometimes faculty can wrestle with these questions. Hmm. 
not in a way that they're listening to me lecture. I don't lecture. In a way that they can learn from each other's mm-hmm. experiences. Mm-hmm. Because that's the power. All of us, all of us are the same on these dimensions, you know? <laughs> Who doesn't want an integrated life? Who isn't struggling with trying to have a great home life and a great sure. work life and no, a great it, personal life? Everybody it's, does that. It seems to be universal. That's definitely my experience. And, and what you offer, I think, is not only an example, but some conscious uh, you know, methods for being you know, deliberate and kind of fearless in, 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 asking those, in asking those questions. So what have you learned from the work that you've been doing at West Point and the seminars you've, uh, you've led there? It's a great question. Um, I've learned that, once again, questions are more important than answers. Mm-hmm. If you get the right questions, people engage. Absolutely. Number two, I've learned we have more to learn from each other than we think. Uh, we we want to learn from authorities uh, and successful people, and, and that's, a, of course, a great source of learning. But everybody around you can teach you. I've, I've learned from 19-year-old cadets who ask questions that I hadn't thought about. Such I've learned as? From, pardon me? Can you, can you think of one offhand? Um, how... Can I, at age 19, develop the confidence Hmm. to confront a superior when I think that superior is making a mistake? What a great question. (laughs) Where did that go? That's a pretty good question. Well, that's so real. I mean, you can see how so many people would wrestle with that, particularly at West Point. So where'd you go with that? I turned it around to the class, and I Mm -hmm. said, class... Have any of you ever confronted a question or situation like this? Some of the class had actually been Mm -hmm. deployed in Iraq and or Afghanistan. So these are young people who had enlisted in the Army, uh, served, and then applied to college and were accepted into West Point. And we had a robust conversation Mm -hmm. about how to address problems with your boss. Mm Mm-hmm. And subsequent to that, we had a robust conversation about content that's out there, and I brought in some articles about how to manage up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there are, there are ways of addressing it. There are we... ways of addressing that which have to do with exerting influence mm-hmm. rather than control, because obviously you can't control your superior. But you can't ask questions, and you can't ask advice from others. And that's, so, that's really been... say there are some tactics that can address certain things, or at least give you some hope of addressing certain things. But it's asking the questions and finding a way to ask those questions in ways that others, others around you, whether they're your boss or your spouse or your kids or whomever, uh, can, ask, can, can answer them and engage in dialogue with you about them. Exactly. Exactly right. So um, as you think, you know, you're, you're still a young man. Uh, with lots to go uh, in terms of uh, you know what what next is on the horizon for what you're trying to achieve in your life. Uh, looking back though at this stage, what would you say is is the worst mistake you've made, and and what did you learn from it? Where my mistakes occur is where they are insidious, involuntary errors. And what do I mean by that? In my case, the pattern of making what I'll call as tactical mistakes, is a rush to judgment. Mm -hmm. It's a rush to judgment. Meaning, for example, I'll say, you know, that was a dumb idea without really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that person, I'm not sure how talented he is Mm -hmm. without really thinking about that. A rush to judgment without giving people what I refer to as the 1% possibility, without leaving my mind open, without leaving my kind of door ajar, to say, you know, I might be wrong on that. Mm. I'll rush to judgment. And when I rush to judgment, I'll pigeonhole people, I'll, I'll pigeonhole ideas, I'll close off, I'll, I'll shut down my receiver on certain things. Mm. And the pattern in my life is that when I do that, I am worse off as a consequence. Mm. Maybe that's why you're so keen on, you know, uh, being so active and almost aggressive in, in asking yourself the difficult questions because you know that about yourself. That's a, maybe so. I mean, that, that, that could be it. I, I know that if I'm not very careful, mm-hmm. I will, I will uh, step on people, step on good ideas, ignore stuff. 
I, you know, I can be very task oriented. And so this rush to judgment, if you said, you know, what's all of us are born with strengths and, and flaws, and I've got more than my share of flaws. This one is a fundamental flaw that I struggle with constantly. And, and your means for compensating for it? Awareness. Yeah. Awareness. And when I see myself doing it, I just put on the brakes. Well, and being really obsessive about getting feedback from people around you. I ask people for feedback. Uh, people on my, you know, that I'm collaborating with, uh, people I'm working with in philanthropy, people that I have uh, you know, partnerships with, boards that I serve on, you know, certainly at home with my uh, wife and, and sons. If, if I'm off, tell me that. Mm -hmm. And even our youngest son, Braden, who's 20 now, you know, he'll, he'll say, he's, he's learned to say, you know, Dad, uh, I hear what you're saying, but have you ever thought about it this way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's one of those things where I now know that phrase is, okay, uh, you know it's hit coming. the pause button. <laughs> <laughs> hit the pause I'm button. I'm not listening. His, ah, okay. So he's asking you, he's learned that he needs to help you to say, stop, uh, right. keep, keep the receiver open. Right. And, and that, that's probably served you pretty well in your family life, generally speaking, I'm guessing. It has, and it's served me well in life overall. You know, I think because rushing to judgment and or sort of shutting ideas or people out or just not having that receiver on, you know, first of all, you're, you're, you're not going to be as, quote, successful in the various aspects of your life if you're operating that way. And, but secondly, you're just going to miss a lot of texture. Mm -hmm. you're, gonna, you're just going to miss a lot of what you could otherwise experience because you've shut stuff out. You've shut stuff out that doesn't actually fit with your mental model in some way. All right. Well, uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time here, Tom. Uh, it's been wonderful speaking with you. If in 15 seconds you could give your, like, what's the big, big idea you'd like to leave our, our listeners with in terms of what you've learned about leading the life you want? So I've, I've thought about this. I didn't know you were going to ask that, but here it is. Um, I, I think this is true in philanthropy when people are giving money away. It's true in, it's true in volunteering. But it's actually true, as near as I can see, in leading a successful life, in leading the life you want. Three characteristics, humanity, humility, and courage. Humanity means caring and empathy, something, something that is broader than mm -hmm. just you. Humility is an open mind to say, you know, I don't have all the answers. And actually, it's not just about me. And courage is the willingness to stand up and try to do the right thing in the right way. Hmm. So I've come to see a mm -hmm. pattern of people who lead successful lives, success defined as building a life, not a resume, but building a successful life across those multiple dimensions of work and family and self and community. They are humble. They have a sense of humanity and they demonstrate and live courage. Tom, thank you so much for joining me this hour and for being a part of this book project. Uh, it has really been a pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure entirely, Stu. Good luck. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tom Tierney. He is a truly exemplary leader in all parts of life. Over his 60-plus years, he's developed himself by being real, being whole, being innovative, by doing things like envisioning the legacy he wants to leave in the future, taking time to regularly reflect on whether he's living in a way that's true to his values, seeing new ways of doing things and supporting others in their quests to meaningfully pursue what matters most in their lives. For more on Tom Tierney, including links and show notes, please visit our website, which is workandlifepodcast.com. And if you like this podcast, Take a second to post a review on iTunes, and you can comment on Twitter at Stu Friedman. Hashtag work and life. Thanks for listening to this episode of Work and Life. This conversation was originally recorded on my weekly radio show on Sirius XM 111, Business Radio, powered by Wharton. Tune in for live broadcasts of Work and Life on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. For more about today's guest and about previous guests, 
check out our blog at workandlifepodcast.com. Join the conversation by tweeting at Stu Friedman. And for more ideas and tools for creating harmony among the different parts of life, check out our website, totalleadership.org, and my book, Total Leadership, Be a Better Leader, Have a Richer Life. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share it with your friends, family, and coworkers. Until next time, I'm your host, Stu Friedman, and I thank you for joining me.